Hello and welcome to the CIDDL Research and Practice Brief Series. My name is Nicholas Hoekstra. The purpose of the Research and Practice Brief Series is to have conversations around the innovative use of technology in special education, early childhood education, related services, and leadership personnel preparation programs. Today, we have with us Dr. Michael Kennedy, Associate Professor in the Department of Education and Human Sciences at the University of Virginia, and Head of the Supporting Teachers Through Coaching, Observations, and Multimedia to Educate Students with Disabilities, or the STORM Lab, as our guest lecturer, as our guest uh, researcher, guest expert. Um, Dr. Kennedy is gonna share with us some of his research and practice around the use of content acquisition podcasts to support pre-service uh, pre -service teacher education. Welcome, Dr. Kennedy. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for joining us. So to start with, and much of your work focuses around the use of multimedia instruction and to enhance learning, whether that be for middle and high school age students, uh, pre-service educators, or in the context of professional development. Um, to begin with, can you describe with us the multimedia tool, uh, which has been the focus of much of your recent research, the content acquisition podcast? Certainly. So uh, CAPS came out of uh, when I was a student at the University of Kansas and doing our uh, university teaching experience, uh, I think it was used to be called SPED 326, which is the intro to special ed course. Maybe it's the same one now. We always had the same issue that, boy, we wish we had more time. Uh, you know, we have 50 minutes or however long the periods were, 75 minutes to sort of get to the students, the teachers and training all of this information. Uh, and we, we didn't feel like we could get it all. And so what if we could pre-record some critical information, uh, have them watch it in an effective way, and then during class would be freed up to do some other things. Today, we might call it the flipped uh, approach to learning. We, we didn't have uh, that word then, or perhaps it existed and I just didn't know, which is probably more likely. Either way, but we wanted to ensure that these videos that we were gonna produce would be of high enough quality that we could ensure that they would result in learning, you know, cause we use all kinds of tools in teacher education that does this work or, you know, I recorded it. So that must mean it's good enough. Um, and I think our field of teacher ed is sort of uh, filled with situations like that. Like most of what we do is convenience rather than know something we know to be effective by way of uh, experimental or quasi-experimental research. So this idea that, well, what if we used uh, validated instructional design principles and specific learning theory to design something that we know we're using all the time, you know, like a, a video uh, recorded podcast. So uh, my colleagues and I, we looked at Richard Mayer's work um, and it was Mayer's work on the cognitive theory of multimedia learning, which itself grew out of cognitive load theory, said, you know, we have sort of these ways that we input information, both using our visual and auditory inputs, but we can only handle so much information at any given time. That's just how the human brain works. And if so, if we design multimedia with that in mind and keep things simple, but also robust, we can positively impact learning. And so that's what we did. Um, we, we learned from Mayer uh, through his various texts and also his um, journal articles and put together the original caps, uh, which would be unrecognizable today because we've learned so much and made them so much fancier mm -hmm. uh, since then. Um, but that's sort of where the idea came from. So we were sort of meshing something we do all the time, which is using um, simple technologies to deliver content to teachers, 
with a more informed uh, set of design principles and learning theories. So that's where the idea uh, came from. And then, well, what if could we could do that same thing for delivering vocabulary instruction for students with disabilities? What if we were to pair explicit vocabulary instruction like student-friendly definitions, using examples, morphological parts of words? What if we took those well-known validated practices and uh, put those into um, a podcast model as well, where we're using visuals plus audio uh, to deliver those evidence-based practices. And that really took off. Uh, that was my dissertation, actually, uh, where just we, to, go ahead. Oh, I, I just want to ask, just to give everyone an idea, your content, content acquisition podcast, what is the length of this podcast? For example, a, a typical podcast, what would be the, the length of it? Sure, sure. So it depends. Uh, so we, we actually have uh, caps for teachers uh, and sometimes they have modeling videos in them. We call those cap TVs. Uh, that, those are the more modern caps we've been making. Um, we also have caps for students, cap S. Um, so a cap for a student would be short. Uh, those would be sometimes three, sometimes five minutes, depending on how much, but, but short. Uh, mm -hmm. The caps for teachers would be a little longer. Um, they could range anywhere from sometimes five on the short end to 15 minutes on the long end if they had the modeling video contained within them. So it definitely depended on the audience. Gotcha. So speaking of that, this kind of brings me into my second question here. Um, in, in your work, you've mentioned that uh, sometimes, especially content area teachers don't feel are not familiar with uh, delivering um, uh, evidence-based practices, especially around um, promotion of skills such as vocabulary yeah. development with students with disabilities. So um, can you kind of describe for us how are you using content acquisition podcasts, especially in pre-service education, to, to ensure that teachers are better prepared to, to enter the classroom and are, are better prepared for the, the diversity of students that they will encounter? Yeah. Yeah, so so this it sort of ties back to that that issue I was, I was raising back when I was first as a doctoral student in my first steps in teacher preparation. Um, we we do a lot of talking in teacher education. You know, we we tell a lot. We tell the candidates, here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to do. But I've always argued, and and others would join me, that we need to do more showing of what we need to do. We need chances for, for teachers to engage in use of specific practices and have an opportunity to receive feedback. This is one of the reasons why practicum experiences are so critical. Uh, it's one of the reasons why, uh, for example, the, the simulator, you know, the Teach Live or Immersion simulator has become so popular is because it, it delivers that. It delivers that hands-on opportunity, um, but still in a safe space. And so we thought, well, okay, CAPS are very good at delivering sort of the declarative knowledge. If I just want to tell you the steps of how to provide student-friendly definitions, CAPS are great for that. Um, it, it's what they originally were intended for. It's a very efficient, very powerful model, according to our data. We have lots of replications of that. But we said, well, what if we showed some videos within showing a teacher implementing the practice that we just described? Um, and then one step further, could a teacher candidate who watched that turn around and then create their own lesson uh, where they were to film and replicate what they saw in the video? And that's what we are trying to do now um, in those kinds of studies within teacher candidates. So we can show, okay, baseline, they don't know it, they, don't, they can't do it, which makes sense because they haven't had a chance to learn it yet. We deliver to them this way to learn it, which is fits in a nice neat box, right? Fits in a nice neat package. Um, so it's nice for experimental control for researchers like us. Then do a post-test. Did they learn anything by way of some kind of quiz? And then can they do it where they film themselves teaching a vocabulary word? And what we would do is pick, you know, a whole bunch of words that have similar characteristics and then randomly assign students to teach different words. So we didn't get a hundred videos with the exact same word in them. Um, and it, it, our results showed um, in a couple different trials that this CAP approach was very powerful. 
um, for doing that. And so we're now trying to replicate that with other kinds of things like reading comprehension strategies mm -hmm. or um, other approaches to learning. Um, and then we're pairing it with interesting kinds of feedback, um, different kinds of feedback options that could go along with the CAPS as well. So there's really a neat opportunity um, for a whole line of scholarship um, and the field and the, the editors and reviewers of this work has been very, been very favorable um, to it because it, it sort of answers one of these questions that our field has is, well, we're all doing things like this, but do we have enough empirical evidence to know that it's actually working? working. Um, and so that's, this is how we're answering that question with, we think so. <laughs> Great. One of the things that you just mentioned is the the aspect of feedback and i know from reading your work one of the one of the the tools that you use for feedback is something that's referred to as a ct scan could you tell us a little bit about the ct scan and, and how you're you're using that kind of what it looks like when you're applying it to um kind of the pre-service teacher education yeah yeah so uh the ct scan is the classroom teaching scan uh uh, CT scan is its nickname. And it's now within a broader program that we call coached. Uh, and what it is, it's an observation measure. Um, it was originally created uh, as part of my IES early career grant that I had um, from 2013 to 2018. And we created it to be a dependent measure that would be able to document um, inclusive middle school science teachers use of vocabulary instruction. So it would document what practices were they using for how much time with what quality uh, and, and it's it's an interesting sort of a, what we call a low inference. Um, measure because it, it captures discrete moves it doesn't give a score, you know, you might be familiar with the Danielson framework or the class measure which give a, a quality score across different domains uh, CT scan does not do that it it says hey you spent four minutes and five seconds delivering a student-friendly definition. And of the five quality indicators, like cueing instruction, clear language, confirming understanding, using images, and one I don't remember, um, you did four of them. And so mm -hmm. that's good. It's great to cue instruction. It's great to use clear language. It's great to use images. What I didn't see you do was um, confirm student understanding. And that is really important because otherwise you're just talking at the kids and you're not sure that they're learning. So the CT scan helps the observer capture that nuance as they're watching, because it's very difficult to watch a live lesson, especially if you're not, not if you don't know what you're watching, you know, if you're walking to a classroom blind uh, or watch a video blind and you don't really know what the teacher's going to do. So the CT scan actually has a whole bunch of categories and menus that allow you to click what you're seeing and document it. Um, and then you can also document events like opportunities to respond, feedback statements, um, and some other some other kinds of things like uh, error corrections and prompts and pre-corrects, uh, data that PBIS people might care about. Um, you can also document what the students are supposed to be doing. Um, it has a little rating of are the students on task. So it gives a timeline of the entire lesson or however, whatever section you wanted to watch it and a non-judgmental data-driven record of what transpired. And then out of that, the coach and the candidate or the teacher can have a conversation. Hey, here's what I saw. What, how did you think that went? And the teachers are often shocked that, oh my goodness, I didn't realize I only asked five questions in 30 minutes and they were all rote level questions. I don't realize I only gave 10 feedback statements the entire class. Um, it's been very powerful um, and transformative uh, in my work and, and in my colleagues' work because it's given us a way um, in this non-biased way to capture the moves of teachers. And then what we say to them is, okay, I, I saw you do X, Y, and Z. I didn't see you do X, Y, and Z. And in the instance where improvement is needed, well, that's where my caps come in. Hey, I've got a short video where you could learn about that practice just on the chance that you're not familiar with it. Right. Um, sometimes they didn't do it because of reasons and that's cool, but sometimes they don't do a practice because they don't know it. So we are able to give them on-demand uh, professional development 
using CAPS or other videos that we have access to. Um, and that's what Coached uh, is able to do. Um, so it sort of generates this feedback um, in an automatic way that can then be supplemented with um, some additional resources. So I have some OSEP funding um, and IES funding where we're working on this and questions around it right now. Um, you can use it for self-observation. You know, so teachers, teacher candidates can watch themselves it's and awesome. then score themselves, um, which is really exciting. And it really helps them to think about the nuance wow. of practice. Um, and that's really what we're looking for, especially when implementing technical practices and other evidence-based practices. No, that makes sense. Um, I'm going to return back to kind of the where, where our conversation begin, uh, began. You mentioned also that the, the CAPS, the Content Acquisition Podcast, um, you also mentioned that they can be really useful for students. I know um, in your work, you've discussed how one of the major barriers to students, uh, especially in like the sciences, for example, is a lack of vocabulary knowledge, but yeah. that the Content Acquisition Podcast can help support that. Could you just touch upon that really uh, just briefly again? Sure. sure. So, so a big issue for all students, especially those with disabilities, English learners, those at risk, but for all students, especially as we get into middle and high school, just the, the volume of what they need to learn um, in all courses, but science in particular. You know, when was the last time you needed to know what mitosis is and what it does? You know, I've made it pretty far in my life and career without having that information. Uh, on the on the tip of my tongue. Yet this is the example of what we're demanding kids know um, and be able to apply that knowledge. And there's hundreds of words per year. Um, and this information sort of snowballs and it creates for students um, a barrier to their entry into STEM kinds of fields and careers because they get hung up and frustrated with the elements of these courses that don't they matter, but they're not the most important thing. You know, a science person would tell you, oh, no, 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 we're doing inquiry, we're doing argumentation, hands-on all, all the time. Sure you are, you know, but you can't do any of those things unless you really understand uh, the language. And so CAPS and our CAP approach um, is, our, is our approach to try to help teachers recognize, hey, we need you to spend at least some time on vocab instruction. Writing the words on the board or saying the definition out loud once is not gonna cut it. So we provide to them actually the unrecorded version of our CAP slides for, for, um, for the students. We just give them the unrecorded versions, say, just use these. Mm -hmm. um, and you can change them. You know, we're, we're very flexible. You know, if you don't like the example we've got in there, change it. You don't like the demonstration we've got in there, change it. Um, but we've been very successful in terms of giving teachers sort of a whole curriculum now. We have like over 150 of these slideshows made um, using Mayer's principles, implementing evidence-based vocabulary practices, but also now merging with um, uh, NGSS and other kinds of science standards so that the science people will actually use them uh, to help support the students' needs um, and we, and then we use the CT scan uh, within the coached system to provide those teachers with professional development to use that. And that's uh, sort of the, the, the purpose of my S4 uh, OSEP stepping up grant. Right. Now, I, I, it's interesting because I, I like how you, you've got the, the, content, the content acquisition podcast. They're being applied in, in a number of different contexts and for some right. reasons. And I think that's something about your work that I, that I personally find very, very interesting. Um, I will go ahead and in the write-up from this interview, I'll include some of the links to the resources that, that you've discussed, as well as provide a little bit more of the background context on um, some of the uh, Myers work that you've mentioned. Good. Um, but I guess um, before we end, I want to thank you very much for, for taking the time today to share with us your work on around the, the CAPS. And uh, it's been a very interesting conversation. Um, um, so in closing, um, for more information on the um, uh, CIDDL research and practice briefs, uh, briefs and uh, other resources for higher education and related services, please go to CIDDL.org. 
don't forget to follow us on social media, subscribe to our channel, and leave us a message. Thank you all very much for watching, and thank you again, Dr. Kennedy, for your time. My pleasure. And uh, don't anyone watching this, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I'd be glad to connect. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.